Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, January the 23rd, 2014. Now, our top story tonight is a reminder from the Syrian Electronic Army that CNN has been serving as nothing more than a propaganda arm for the Obama administration in this buildup for war in Syria. They took over their Twitter feed and they put out some interesting tweets. It said, Obama bin Laden, the Lord of Terror, is brewing lies that the Syrian state controls al-Qaeda. He says, don't forget, al-Qaeda is al-Qaeda, funded, armed, and controlled. And of course, that's exactly what Paul Joseph Watson was talking about in his article on InfoWars today, that al-Qaeda is the best enemy that money can buy. He points out that recent reports that al-Qaeda militants have taken over parts of Iraq serve as a stark reminder that the U.S. has for decades played a crucial role, both directly and indirectly, aiding the spread of terrorists around the Middle East and North Africa as a Machiavellian tool of neocolonialism, creating enemies as we need them. He says the reemergence of al-Qaeda in Iraq emphasizes how the U.S.'s near nine-year occupation of the country, during which hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, along with thousands of U.S. troops, were killed, was a colossal failure. And we've had congressmen, we've had Ted Cruz, as well as Dennis Kucinich, talk about how we don't want to be al-Qaeda's air force. It's not a secret, even though the people who are reporting this CNN hack of their, this, the hack of the CNN Twitter feed, even though they're scoffing at people calling al-Qaeda Obama's army and talking about how he's a lord of terror, that's exactly what has been happening. And it's no secret. Both Democrats and Republicans have been saying this. It's no longer anything that they're even trying to hide. And he points out here, this goes all the way back to 9-11. He points out at the bottom of the article, he says, Barely weeks before 9-11, former members of al-Qaeda, who subsequently joined the Kosovo Liberation Army, were airlifted out of Macedonia by U.S. paratroopers. And as FBI translator Sebel Edmonds had revealed, the U.S. maintained intimate relations with bin Laden all the way until the day of September 11th. Now, it's not just war in the Middle East that we're concerned about and that we're tracking here. There's also a buildup of war in the Far East. We see a Harvard professor speaking in China. He's an expert on China. And he said that he's warning of a devastating China-Japan war. On the radio show today, Alex Jones talked to historian Margaret McMillan about current parallels to events that led up to World War I. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, Professor. And I, I want to get into the, the, the report I saw at the London Independent. Uh, is it 1914 all over again? We are in danger of repeating the mistakes that started World War I, says a leading historian. So thanks for coming on, and, and, and tell us about the parallels and your concern. Well, there's some things that concern me. I mean, I don't think history ever repeats itself. I think we get similarities, but the conditions are so different. I mean, the 21st century is very different from 100 years ago. But I think what is concerning is we seem to have nationalist rivalries between countries. Um, you have... A rivalry developing, as, as you were mentioning earlier on, in the South China Seas, which has the potential for sparking off further tensions and conflicts. You have international um, ideologies in the years before 1914. There were international ideologies of, of anarchists, for example. Um, today you have international um, ideologies, of religious ideologies or ultra-religious ideologies. So I think we live in a, in a slightly turbulent time. You, you have, we have globalization. Both ages are very globalized, and I think you have people worried about the impact of globalization, um, perhaps turning to, to, to their homes and, and feeling rather defensive. So I think that there are similarities. I mean, I don't think we're bound to end up in the same way they did in 1914, but you always have to be careful. Uh, I forget the exact quote, uh, but basically history doesn't repeat, but it, it kind of rhymes. Who was it said that? Mark Twain. Mark Twain. And, yeah. and, and, and humans act the same, even though we have almost godlike weapons and technology now, would be godlike you know, to, the, uh, to the ancients, Professor. But if you look at global crises, currency devaluations, uh, you know, armies lining up on borders, uh, groups not compromising, uh, really, I see the West driving conflict, uh, and I'm obviously not a fan of what Russia and China do. I'm an American, uh, and I'm you know, a Westerner, but at the same time, I, I really see the West uh, as as filling uh, the shoes of the villain uh, in many respects compared to our position in the past. Well, what's your take on that? Well, I think human nature doesn't really change that much. I mean, I think we like to think we're a lot more sophisticated than the caveman. I'm not sure we are. I mean, I think we're still driven, at least in part, by emotions and fears. And I think what's really dangerous is when 
people lack or nations lack the ability to see things from the other person's point of view. And so what nations do to defend themselves and what we do to defend ourselves as individuals, we may think we're just being defensive, we're just looking out for ourselves, but that may really look like aggression from the other side. And I think that's when it gets dangerous, when you fail to understand what the other person might be thinking. And I think what's also dangerous, and you see it with individuals and you see it with nations again, is when their pride gets involved and when their prestige gets involved. I mean, you, you, you know, I think an analogy is, is the members of gangs, um, who were, to me, rather like knights in the Middle Ages. They'd rather die than be dishonored. And so I think this is, this is a perennial strain in human nature. Now, we, we've, we've got a more sensible side, and I think we've got a more reasonable side, and we've got a side where we do reach out, we do try and understand each other. So, you know, I never like to think that, that history is going to repeat itself, but I, I think we, can, we, should be warned, we should be careful about being too complacent. He said there's simmering anger in China that's highlighted by Japan's historical revisionism, which refuses to accept responsibility for the Second World War in their textbooks and schools. And he says, there's, of course, there's also the dispute over these islands. And then he also points out how the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe just recently visited a shrine in Tokyo honoring 14 war criminals who were subsequently executed for war crimes by the Allies. Now, of course, remember that Waterboarding was one of those crimes for which we executed Japanese war criminals. But we brought over a lot of war criminals, both Nazi and Japanese war criminals, to the United States as part of Project Paperclip. And we're now seeing fallout from that from Army veterans who were then experimented on by these very same Nazis. In an article by Adon Salazar says the Army continues to cover up secret experimentation 65 years later, they've got a lawsuit that was filed five years ago, still dragging through the courts because the DOD and the U.S. Army are attempting to delay a court order that would force them to provide certain notice to Vietnamese veterans, disclosing the extent to which they'd been secretly used as test subjects for experimentation. Now, this lawsuit says that with the help of Nazi scientists recruited through po Project Paperclip, the Army and the CIA used at least 7,800 veterans as human guinea pigs at the Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland, alone. That's just at one site they use 7,800 people. And of course, these are experiments that are part of MK Ultra, Operation Bluebird, Pandora, Monarch, all these familiar terms, anybody that knows anything about the history of the CIA, the dark history of the CIA, things that came out during the church committee hearings in the 1970s. And the lawsuit goes on to say that the U.S. government sought drugs to control human behavior, cause confusion, promote weakness or temporary loss of hearing and vision, and many other effects. Now, when we look at what the Japanese government did and what they're being criticized for by the Chinese, that they would build a monument to honor war criminals, what did the U.S. do? We built a bureaucracy so that they could continue with their criminal behavior, they continue with their experimentation on other humans. But this time they were experimenting on American soldiers, college volunteers, and of course, prisoners that we have here in the United States, and we have more than any other country. But the experimentation continues. Now it's taking the form of another criminal bureaucracy, Homeland Security. And we see that Major League Baseball is playing ball with them, just like the NFL. Major League Baseball is preparing new DHS screening measures at all ballparks, writes Mikhail Thalen. He says that uh, they just tested some of these last year, and the baseball representative is very excited. He says, we conducted testing of these measures at the All-Star Game and at both World Series venues last year, and we were pleased that it was effective and received without issue from the fans. That's right, they just passively went along with the new control techniques like good servants who have been confused and had their behavior modified. This is nothing but operant conditioning behavior, straight from Skinner. They start at the airports, and then they go to the ball games because they know that when you're ready to travel, they can give you a nice reward if you behave the way they want you to. It's nice, positive operant conditioning. And they do the same thing now at all major league sports. They're bringing that in. They're gradually rolling out. But it's not going to be just all nice, positive conditioning. There's going to be some consequences when they start rolling this out all over. They're not going, they're going to take the gloves off at that point. And we now have a major new voice that is slamming what the NSA is doing. Now, we've had senators, we've had NSA whistleblowers, and now we've got a new board, which I'd never even heard of before. It's called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Now, one of the reasons you haven't heard of this, probably, is because they were created back in 2004. They were originally just dismissed as a propaganda arm of the Bush administration. But then they went through a reform in 2007, and what happened at that time was they got a little bit more independent. They were appointed by Senate confirmation. 
Still, they never met until November, this last November, 2013. Now, this is what they had to say. They said, only minimal benefits in counterterrorism efforts have come from the bulk collection of phone call records, that it's illegal and it should be shut down. And they say it lacks a viable legal foundation under Section 215. That's Section 215 of the Patriot Act. See, it's not even authorized under the Patriot Act, as bad as the Patriot Act is. But they go on. They say it implicates constitutional concerns under the First and Fourth Amendments, raises serious threats to privacy and civil liberties as a policy matter, and has shown only limited value. As a result, the board recommends that the government end the program. How about that? Same recommendation that we have about that. It's clear to everyone that it's a violation of the First and Fourth Amendment. You have to have a search warrant. You have to have cause. We've had whistleblowers who have gone to the mat, and yet we still have people like Bill Gates and others who are saying that we need to trade off our privacy for security. Well, you'll never have security if you don't have privacy and freedom. And there's some people who understand this in the Ukraine. We see a lot of reports coming out of very violent revolution going on there, fighting in the streets. It looks like some kind of a post-apocalyptic scene. They've created their own versions of makeshift riot gear. Take a look at some of these things they've got here. Motorcycle helmets they're using, shields, clubs that they've made. They've even got slingshots, catapults, trebuchets. Both the police and the rioters are throwing Molotov cocktails at each other. And we've had hundreds of people injured on both sides. We've had at least five protesters killed. One has been allegedly killed by a police sniper. This is amazing. Why do these people want to get into the EU so bad? Well, the answer is that they don't necessarily want to get into the EU as badly as they want to get away from Russia. Two generations ago, they suffered from something called the Holodomor. Now, this was actually a Soviet genocide in the Ukraine. This was talked about by a man named Raphael Lemkin, who actually coined the term genocide. And he used Stalin's genocide against the Ukraine as a definition of what genocide was, a perfect example of it. And he said the Soviet genocide in the Ukraine followed a four-pronged attack. Now, here's the four prongs that they did. And look and see if this sounds familiar to what's going on in America today. Number one, they took out the intellectual leadership. Number two, they co-opted the churches. They said, you either become loyal to the Russian government or we're going to shut you down. The third thing they did was they destroyed the food supply. And that was the main way that they killed most of the people was with a horrific famine in the Ukraine. And the last thing he did was he fragmented the Ukrainian people by adding to the Ukraine other people from outside the area. This is exactly what we see happening here. And if we don't want to see these kind of post-apocalyptic pictures happening here, we need to do everything we can to keep these kinds of scenes from happening in the U.S. Now, if it happens here, it's going to be something called democide, where the government kills the people. It's not going to be directed at any particular ethnic group or nationality. It'll be against everyone. So we all need to join to make sure this doesn't happen. Now, right after the break, Leanne McAdoo has a special report about Disney's RFID and how they're going to use that to train your children to live in a police state. And Glenn Trolls, one of our new crew members here, who you might remember went to California with Jakari Jackson and others. He lived in California for several years. He's going to tell us what his exposure there showed in his blood. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. My friends, Alex Jones here to tell you about some of the most important information concerning you and your family's health. Radiation levels have more than doubled in the last 60 years in the Northern Hemisphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. 